uh, I'm gonna uh, the introduce um, uh, each you know the speaker um, who I think they recently published a fantastic book in my in my own you know the reading uh, these book would you know uh, be regarded as you know actually monumental achievement which uh, led us to reread the whole uh, history of uh, critical theory or technology you know and then uh, some kind of media study and then uh, this is uh, quite a turning point in my opinion so i'm really i opened and then my mind is uh blown you know my mind was blown when i'm reading uh his book all right the first uh, you know the writer and then uh, author of the code uh, actually this book i don't think you cannot see this one yeah sorry about this and uh, um, Bernard uh, Fagan, uh, he's a writer, media theorist, and a historian of science. Uh, his research explores how digital technology uh, shapes the science, culture, and the environment. And then his book, uh, titled Code, recently published by Duke University, is the subtitle is very interesting, From Information Theory to Print Theory. It's, uh, in my opinion, actually, the, uh, it, if you read this book, uh, you would find out lots of, you know, the, um, the clue by which we can reread, you know, so-called post-structuralism or some further post-modernism. And then this book is a kind of final version of this, uh, you know, the study, in my opinion. So um, the, I, I hope, you know, the lots more people actually read this book and then, you know, the, we advanced our study, you know, in this field, you know, the, which to some point stuck to some... Uh, academic you know the discipline or some kind of a university discourse we should you know expand something um that the uh, relevant this you know topic uh to uh, you know beyond the um the what we actually already studied uh, you know so i think actually um uh, he now the you know the study um many you know topics and then he's gonna uh, talk about uh the key points he uh, wrote down in this book, and then uh, it would it would you know help us to understand this book further. Okay, and the second you know the the speaker and then writer is a uh, Ushi uh, Parika, is a professor in digital aesthetic and culture at Aarhus University, where he teaches in the department of digital design and information study, and then leads the AUFF funded project design and aesthetic for environmental data. And then Parika is also a visiting professor at PAMU, F-A-M-U, at the Academy of Performing Arts in Prague, where he leads the project Operational Image and Visual Culture, and at the, also the Winchester University and Art, University of South Central. So uh, we ha I'm really happy uh, to uh, have these people, and then uh, we will actually have you know, the productive you know, talk, um, hopefully, and then I think I really believe in you know that actually we can uh, bring in this more insightful and then productive you know the dialogue uh, between two uh, speakers and then uh, you know the uh, Bernard will you know will uh, deliver his talk first and then Ushi also uh, bring up the, you know the uh, the his own idea the, upon on this topic and then also uh, this you know fantastic book is operational images and then also, the, in my opinion, the um, kind of, you know, the, the mark the turning point of the media study and then images study. And then he would, you know, change our conventional, uh, the concept of image. And then this book also very nice and then already actually quite well known in Korea. But uh, I hope, you know, the common reader should uh, read, read, read this one and then you can find lots of information and then knowledge about, you know, image and then, uh, you know, the media study and the cinema study and many uh, relevant you know field okay okay and just stop the after my introduction and then all right just Bernard your turn and then you know and then you right. kind of start. yeah okay just uh, screen is yours okay let me activate some slides to supplement this <laughs> Okay. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that very generous, not only introduction, but also the invitation to to speak, Alex. Um, 
it's exciting not only to be uh, in conversation with Alex, another thinker of cybernetics and French theory, um, but also, um, you know, having having written this book that we see here in the background code, um, it's really exciting to rethink this work alongside UC's work um, because when you when you know reading through UC's work on um, operative images, operational images, I certainly, um, I find myself rediscovering and reimagining problems that I think were at the center of my book. Um, so I'm going to try to, in a very kind of informal manner, um, walk through some of the ideas in my book, but also partly how I see them differently after having having gotten to read Yussi's book, um, um, which is just, is you know, has been thrilling for me to read. Um, so just to say a couple of background words about my book. Um, here's part of the basic concept. So the, the the idea of the book is that the rise of so-called theory, critical theory in the 20th century in the US in places like Frankfurt and Paris or Providence in the United States is I think among other things, a story, a particular story of the operation, operationalization of critique or at least that's one way I would think of it after, after reading UC's book. That is the manner in which forms of criticism, forms of philosophy, forms of reading um, in the course of the 20th century, in some ways, in certain circles, moved away from impressionistic styles of interpretation, of finding deep meaning, in terms of new forms of rigor and theoretical analysis that were modeled by technical sciences. Part of the idea of this, right, there's a paranoid way of reading the story. Right? You can write the story that the rise of cybernetics and computing kind of imperializes the entire 20th century intellectual landscape, which in a way is true, right? But I don't think that's really the story that I'm interested in. What I'm really interested in is how a lot of theorists, that many of them that would be central to the humanities, partly saw the task of 20th century humanities and human sciences to reconceptualize their own embeddedness in a technical and industrial world. And that led them to think of their to think their research in relationship to media, technology, information, communication, and for example, fields like operations research, cybernetics. Um, so you know, with that in mind, I have two you know two quotes in the backdrop here that sort of remind me of what I'm thinking about. One would be a, a claim by Roland Barthes in the mid '60s, where he's describing his own work. This is a key moment in developing semiotics, where he says. What we can develop is only a theory in the entirely unambitious, unpretentious sense that Americans use the word, right? This interest of Bart in the 60s of thinking about theory doesn't mean some kind of high recourse to continental philosophy, right? But actually a kind of systematic scientific thinking that he actually saw he, with, with a sense of humor. He's, he, he looked towards the United States, towards communications research, towards cybernetics as a model for what theory does. Another quote I think about is Michel Foucault's remarks in the 70s on what was going on in what could be called the structuralist and post-structural and semiotic revolution in France in the 1960s. And he told the reviewer, the whole relentless theorization of writing we saw in the 60s was doubtless only a swan song. Through it, the, writing was fight the writer was fighting for the preservation of his political privilege, but the fact that it was precisely a matter, but the fact is it was a precisely a matter of theory that he needed scientific credentials, end quote. So when Foucault looked back at this proliferation of interest of what writing was in the 1960s, what he really saw as an attempt to develop a scientific and technological approach to writing. And he said this was partially about academics in the human sciences trying themselves to get some type of scientific credential, to try to think about things like language or things like image with the same sort of rigor that the post-war world, the post-war technical sciences had presented as a model of things like state power, political power, and so on. And the, the history of how critique was received, for example, in North America, often laid an emphasis on highfalutin kind of critical philosophical European intellectual traditions. And in my book, part of what I've been interested in is looking at actually how the transformation of critique was partially related to the types of operational and technical processes that UC writes about in his book, for example. So a number of the theorists I write about, I write about Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead, Cloud Levy Strauss, Roman Jakobson, Jacques Lacan, Roland Barthes, Luce Irgaray who in various ways across the 50s and 60s reconceived their studies of, for example, literature, 
psychoanalysis, uh, ethnography, linguistics, increasingly in terms of technical communications moderated, modeled on something like operational series. That is, how is it that we can transform a set of family practices? How can we understand a set of, say, artistic practices in terms of technical, logically ordered communication series that we can analyze partly with insights from technical media? Now, UC's book, of course, provides examples of how we how uh, the image itself becomes a decisive site for mm -hmm. understanding operational series operation operational serialized analysis. And uh, throughout my book, one of the things I come back upon again and again is actually how a number of the theorists that I'm interested in they saw in media such as film and photography a new way of rendering culture operational, right? So hence my interest in talking about a few of these themes today with UC, uh, with us, right? So just to pick one example, uh, someone I discuss at great length in my book, Cloud Levy Strauss, the well-known anthropologist and founder of Structural Anthropology. In the course of Levy Strauss's career, one of the things I'm, yeah, I'm interested in the book is that he goes through a certain transformation. Here we see, for example, uh, two pages from uh, a 1930s um, exhibition he organized on his uh, reporting on his visits to the interior of Brazil, to the Mato Grosso uh, people. And um, in this early moment in Levi Schaus's work in the 1930s, we see, for example, a great interest in photography, a great interest in physical artifacts, a great interest in how it is that one of the ways that you can understand, for example, you can develop a science of man, a science of the human condition, is through getting physical artifacts that are possibly at risk of being destroyed with the destruction of indigenous populations globally, right? Mm -hmm. And this is an important foundation to Levi Strauss's work in anthropology that he develops in the 1930s, and he never really gives up on. However, one sees in the course of the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, his interest in, for example, what photography does, what physical artifacts do, do, is transformed in relationship to an entire host of scientists interested in modeling, for example, operational series. Let's see if I can. <clears throat> right. So how is it that Levi Strauss, who starts as in some ways a kind of classical anthropologist, increasingly becomes something like a scientist of communication, a scientist of operational series? One way of tracing that transformation is looking at various images that circulate throughout his work in the course of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and the types of data with which he's working. So on the top left, for example, we see an image from his uh, celebrated elementary structures of kinship, where among other things, he's trying to model formal laws for de describing uh, kinship systems, the exchange uh, particularly of women within indigenous tribes, and the attempt to model it on a more or less kind of algebraic system. This is where he's at in the late 40s and the early 50s. Around that time, he starts reading cybernetics, he starts reading information theory, and of course, he's swept away by, by, by Roman Jakobson's work in structural linguistics. And on the base of that, basis of that, you see increasingly, increasing, uh, increasingly almost, um, uh, uh, how do you describe it? I would almost say a kind of maniacal attempt to understand culture in terms of combinatorics and to understand culture in terms of operational series. So we see a second image on the bottom, le on the bo on the bottom left here, which is supposed to be an algebraic uh, analysis of transformations of myth that appears in uh, the raw and the cooked. Below that to the right, uh, we see uh, a beautiful diagram of social structure and marriage rules of uh, the Elandra type, which appeared in Savage Mind. There's a beautiful article on this by Campolo uh, called Signs and Sight in Gray Room. And on the far right, we see Levi Shows at home in the human relations area file at the laboratory for uh, uh, social anthropology at the Collège de France. Across these works, you actually see a kind of history of Levi Strauss's transformation. He starts as an ethnographer in the field. He's, after he becomes a teacher, he works for some time as an administrator for the United Nations, who's interested in using social science to do a data-driven analysis of how to uh, organize and coordinate human behavior uh, or organize and coordinate human societies globally. And bit by bit, 
an embrace of scientific and technical methods that can reorganize anthropological study and put it more or less shoulder to shoulder with fields like information theory, computing, cybernetics, game theory. And it sort of ends with him running this extraordinary lab at the Collège de France, where the lab itself was a center for large scale data driven analysis, constant exploration for how can we use things like punch cards to model kinship, to model mythology, uh, to calculate the possible transformations that a society undergo. None of this, none of this abandons this very early work of his in, for example, photography, in physical artifacts, right? What it does though, and you see this in a certain proliferation of diagrams that I think UC's work helps us understand, it's a transformation in what we, how we make sense of, for example, visual evidence. We gradually lose interest. I, don't, I hate to say that, I think this is also something, it's very easy to, I, I do this myself. I slip into an, a, a, a rhetoric as if this is a story of rising abstraction, uh, a, a, a loss of physical visual forms. That's not actually the case. It's, uh, it's this powerful retention of empirical ethnographic inquiry, which is increasingly understood in terms of how can you grasp it in terms of series? How can you grasp it in terms of patterns? How can you take a whole series of, for example, ethnographic uh, observations and turn them into the basis for uncovering patterns, systematized patterns and codes that organize an entire culture? Within this process, and this is part of the reason why I put these particular images on the screen here, images have a dual function, right? On one hand, you see new ways of reading images, right? The images themselves be something, become something that you have to scrutinize to find small patterns. And then the images themselves also become a tool for taking the everyday flow of human culture and transforming it into discrete series that can be analyzed in the search for patterns. <clears throat> now, you know, one of the reasons I'm particularly interested in reading this alongside Yusi's book, there's clearly a story here of how, for example, technical sciences shape and transform the human sciences and what it means to say, look, or to read, to look at an image, to read an image. But I think there's also very much a story of how the human sciences themselves acted as something like a test bed, right? Uh, a repository for new ways of reading, for new ways of analysis that would make possible ultimately dreaming of things like big data, that would make, make possible dreaming of things like social networks, right? So in the time I have left, I wanna to jump to another example of this, right? Go to the case of Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson, the well-known colonial ethnographers. There are many other things, but I think it's important that they start their career largely as colonial ethnographers. One of the things I try to figure out in my book is how is it that two researchers initially known for their work in, for example, ethnographic studies in the Pacific came to co-found the Macy Conferences on Cybernetics. So we see an image of the Macy Conferences on one side. We see Mead and Bateson in Bali on the other. There's a, obviously a well-established narrative of cybernetics. It's about the history of fields like computing and information theory blowing up during World War II and expanding out across the sciences where they end up reaching fields like anthropology and linguistics and semiotics. In my book, I'm sort of interested in a different type of process to say, well, one of the things is people like Mead and Bateson were organizing the Macy conferences before Wiener or von Neumann were ever involved, right? It seems that they had a foundational role in developing these new and uh, developing frameworks by which sciences of communication would, would not only take culture as one of their primary concerns, but bring in engineers like Wiener, von Neumann, Shannon, Weaver, to discuss uh, what it is that the technical sciences can tell us about human culture or the sciences more generally. So how is it that, what, how is it that Mead and Bateson came to the Macy conferences and came to co-organize them? A major part of that story is that already by 1940, 19, say 1942, they were, world renowned as kind of as innovative researchers of media technical analysis. The basis of their reputation for media te technical analysis was their photographic and filmic studies undertaken in Bali between 1936 and 1939, where you see among other things, an in, uh, highly innovative and also highly problematic use of photography and film and transcriptions to effectively operationalize culture, right? They wanted to fight the idea that there's a kind of 
primitive or somehow less developed rationality in indigenous cultures. And they said, actually, indigenous cultures embody an entirely complex system of reasoning. It's filled with recursive systems. It's filled with patterns. But you can't see that with the naked eye. In order to see that, you need, for example, photographic analysis that goes frame by frame, moment by moment, to, re to reveal basically a microstructuring of exchange and interaction in everyday life. Out of this research, um, they develop a new approach towards photography, a new approach towards film, a new approach towards recording, new approaches towards transcription that all promise to deliver a theoretical rigor to anthropology, a theoretical rigor to ethnography that they claim, and we can discuss the reasons that this is not necessarily true, but they claim it's going to develop essentially a less racist anthropology, partially because it's a more scientific and technical approach that uh, goes dispels with human interpretation that will always tend to prejudice foreign cultures and instead finds basic elementary patterns organizing everyday life. And so one of the things that they effectively do with photography and with film is that they turn practice into a kind of infrastructure. They turn practice into large-scale distributed systems where a single frame or a series of frames become a point of entry to re-understanding, for example, dance, music, child rearing, kinship as operational series. On the basis of this work, a couple of things happen. Bateson, among other things, co-founds the Palo Alto Group, which we see here. The Palo Alto group develops an approach to psychiatry based on the so-called double binds, the notion that mental illness comes from communicative paradoxes, particularly in the family. And what you see is there's kind of two things framing this wonderful picture. I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating picture, this picture of the Palo Alto group when they were doing early work in um, mental hospitals in the 1950s, right? In the foreground, you have uh, a magnetic tape recorder, which would be used to record conversations and break them down for finer and finer grand analysis into operational units that describe communicative patterns. And in the backdrop, you see a kinship diagram, father, father, mother, child, describing different communicative patterns, right? Across these researchers that drive a kind of theoretical operational critique in the human sciences in the 20th century, you find constant recourses to technical media and to diagrams. And they work together essentially to transform families into infrastructures, uh, conversations into series. Here we see another image. So this is an image I've edited out the subjects because they haven't really authorized to be shown. But here we see a video uh, that was shot in the late 60s by some of, of Bateson's colleagues of family therapy, where they were discussing with a group where a member of the family had a, uh, something characterized as a mental illness. Uh, by filming the family, they sought to transform everyday real-time interactions into operational series that could be broken down for communicative patterns. And that work itself, that form of filmic uh, approach to mental health care that's taking clues from cybernetics, that's taking clues from uh, colonial research, itself is modeled on and partly on a whole series of cybernetic experiments such as we see here. Uh, on the left, you see a diagram from above of how you would sit, how you would or sit families around a table. On the right, you see a similar version of the experiment run with uh, uh, U.S. soldiers, um, where the goal was um, to transform everyday social interactions into operational series, partly by using film and photography, partly by using recording, and partly by using theories from information theory and cybernetics to reconceptualize family interaction, to reconceptualize kinship, to reconceptualize mental illness. And so across my book, I examine these, this type of operational restructuring of the human sciences in fields like semiology, psychoanalysis, anthropology, linguistics. Uh, and at the backdrop of it, you're, I essentially, I tell a story that's interested in why cybernetics and information theory were such a kind of key point of reference for this transformation, right? And how that works in people like Mead, Bateson, Irigaray, Levi Strauss, and so on. But it's really just a small change to actually say, you could also understand this as a way of reorganizing culture into operations that in turn reorder oppositions, right? 
when you when you render, for example, uh, family interactions as a more or, less, more or less cybernetic series of communications, you start upsetting some of the differences between technical and human uh, communications. You upset the differences between scientific and cultural fields of analysis, fields of expertise. You see very much a kind of overturning of an apparent opposition between technological and aesthetic analysis, right? So uh, I don't say much about this today, but what's key to many of these projects is that they're actually deeply, profoundly aesthetic projects. This is not images become technical, as also technology become increasingly a problem of aesthetics. Out of that other divides between nature and culture, between the modern and the primitive, all of these kinds of traditionally organizing distinctions, these researchers saw an attempt to upset them, to reorder them, to challenge them. Uh, through a new use of operations that seized upon image making. So hence I make this, I have this phrase at the bottom, images make operations accessible. Part of the reason researchers obsessed with cybernetics found so much use in filmmaking is because it was a user-friendly point of entry into understanding abstract technical series. And I think that when we understand this, for example, backdrop to the human sciences, to how many so-called theorists uh, lean so heavily on, for example, fields like cybernetics and information theory, as well as image making. I think this is basically a backdrop for rethinking what the human sciences can and should be doing today in these eras of big data, in these eras of digital humanities, right? I think, I, I think in a sense, we're being challenged in the humanities today to fulfill problems and also respond to lapses, failures, and oversights that defined the kind of great moment of theory between 1930 and 1965, which was also a moment of operations and cybernetic analysis. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, great talk. And then uh, you actually you know clarified uh, the what the the point and uh, the that actually you know the what we uh, should have focused on. All right. So uh, could you stop the sharing the screen? Okay, and then uh, next speaker in the Ushi, and then yeah, the, anything is okay. You respond to this talk, and then also the, you develop your own idea. The, the screen is mm -hmm. yours. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, let's see. I'm not going to share. This is probably um, really a nice way of putting it as well. That um, Bernard um, shared some images because usually the ways in which we think about cybernetics doesn't, you know, it comes out as diagrams, but they are one kind of an image as well. I'm not going to share images, even if, you know, I'm supposed to talk about images, um, probably to prove a point as well, partly. Um, a big thank you, Alex, for hosting us and and big thank you, Bernard, for writing the book and also this um, really, really incisive summary of where you point out the resonances between our books. I'll try to do a bit of the same as well, and then our dialogue can do even further work on that area as well. And, and there's really lots to discuss in terms of these nice overlaps and the sort of a like notion of information aesthetics that is not so, so generic as the term implies information aesthetics, but actually very concretely about devices, devices that can be di or diagrams as devices and, and these charts as, as, as devices. So there's something about the notion of this diagrammatic as, a, as an instructional format and hence already at the very center of operational images. And there's much more in our books as well, and, and the ways in which your, your book um, outlines a history of something that is often not historicized. The operational image is often taken as a particularly briefly mentioned, it's often briefly contextualized, but rarely systematically historicized. And this this, this, this story of the information sciences should be one of those. That's what I'm going to hint in my brief uh, 20 minute or so thing. And um, and yeah, exactly. So um, what I want to do in this short introduction of sorts, the short talk is to both give a sense of some of the topics in the book, operational images, and also to point to some things outside the book, so to speak. What we also want to do is set up some of these key points of contact, as already mentioned, and, and, and they sort of a roughly speak of the same period or shared period, perhaps, and certain concerns of 
as also in Bernard's book um, of, of shift from warfare to welfare, as he put it through, um, was it also through Jennifer Light's work, and which I find very apt. Um, and and how they relate to questions, these books relate to questions of digital culture, humanities, um, by not just context of technology, but technological forms of knowledge and aesthetics. Bernard's book has a specific relation to digital humanities. Mine has a specific relation to questions of images and data and the difficulty of doing visual culture studies in the age that is increasingly not really visual, um, paradoxically so, or not just visual or perhaps invisual, as I argue, building on the notion of individuality that Anna Munster and Adrian McKenzie have proposed in their work. So my point summarizing what is in the book, you would think that summarizing what is in the book would be the easy part. Even if narrating something that is crystallized as a book, um, but it's actually a multi-year research project is not really easy as we know. Um, research projects are rhizomatics, books are not supposed to be rhizomatic. Writing is quite rhizomatic. Often books are not supposed to be so rhizomatic unless one is Deleuze and Guattari, um, who I like a lot. Um, books often consist of good intentions, of false leads, of possible directions, only some of which are present in the final written part. Some part of the dialogues in the books become visible. Some um, some of them are invisible cognitive infrastructures, even if they took place during the research process and writing. So projects are, of course, much more than what comes out in readable form, the, to state the obvious. So even the part of narrating of what is in the book is not so easy um, and puts more pressure on also the second part of how to tell what is beyond the book, um, what sort of is already... This, this complex set of resolutions that haunt any finished project. So one could narrate books also as to what they do not contain through the other possible routes that could have been taken. And to elaborate this way, the thought processes and methodologies at the back of their birth, um, for instance, as I will hint, it would have been nice, it would be probably smart or sort of just full-fledged um, sort of a take on operations research as the context. And I think that is a really relevant theme that comes out in nuanced ways also in Bernard's book. Um, anyway, this sort of a like, this sort of a narrative, we could call this to be about resolutions. Resolution, both in the sense of display resolutions or something visual, often measured by the number of pixels that make up a specific way we see an image and its scales of details but also resolutions in the sense of decisions, paths taken, paths untaken. And this is sort of related quite closely to resolution studies. The notion of resolution studies comes actually from artist Rosa Menkman and her project into visual cultures and individual cultures. And this project of hers, which is also featured in, in my book, sort of concerns two aspects of what is visible and how do resolutions along the way of production of visible, visibility, invisibility, even in, visu in visuality, come to take place. So Rosa's Impossible Images is featured in the book as well. So it's this sort of a, like a mindset of thinking through resolutions, both as a reflective methodology, but also as a theme in its own right. Um, it's fun to read books backwards in this manner that teases out those resolutions as such. So take operational images. Um, at the moment, the book is sort of a deep dive into the notion developed by filmmaker Harun Faroki, a concept often defined in a very circular fashion. Operational images only primar um, primarily operate, only secondarily they might represent something. They are instructions for action, as Thomas Elsa Sir once put it, putting them into a broader question of algorithmic that is not always only digital. I like this as it already implies that they are not just about digital culture or digital images. They are about this longer stretch of notions of instruction or perhaps indeed diagrams as, as we just heard as well. Um, I also like how Hito style um, has defined Baroque's interest in operational images in the expanded sense. 
images are operating systems for the world or into the world as ways of grasping the world uh, by way of images that themselves grasp the world. It's recursive. It's a recursive task immediately. It asks this really ontogenetic question of what worlds are being created, what images act as actions, what kind of images are part of the broader institutions of power relations as well. And it's really difficult to sort of speak about, it would be very difficult to speak about Farocchi and Farocchi's interest. It's, it's not the main interest of my book is not about Farocchi, but it's still a core central point. It would be really difficult to talk about Farocchi without nodding to the context in which we're doing at the moment, considering his own work and how his own work related to industrialization of violence across 20th century and 21st century as the backdrop through which visual culture and his own methodology in film and video are being investigated. His interest in war and violence, something that is visibly present on a constant basis again, um, after the Hamas attack in the midst of Israel's extreme military operations towards civilian population in Gaza, alongside the settler colonial measures across Palestine. It is difficult to refer to operational images and the adjacent terms such as phantom images that Farocchi used without thinking what phantoms are being summoned in these cases and many others, what phantom, phantoms of death are being produced by the operations, what visibilities and invisibilities are being produced in the midst of these operations, from images to concrete territorial disappearance of people, of buildings, of infrastructures. This is very concrete way of understanding its impact at the moment, as far as it concerns what has been claimed as the limited provision of images from Gaza by satellite image providers such as uh, Planet. On some days, this has meant no provision of images at all. On some days, only medium resolution images. One could narrate these very concrete technical details around the past a month of military operations and the longer stretch of military operations. These Small details add to the sort of infrastructure war that um, IDF has been waging across the Gaza Strip with disastrous humanitarian consequences. All not random at all, but operationally planned so, as per the earlier tested and tried the Dahir doctrine of the IDF that allows mass scale damaging of civilian infrastructures, not as an accident, but as intentional part of operational work. To be clear, this is where the idea of operational images as about smart we weapons is problematized. And the broader aspect of operational thinking comes to the fore, that it's not even anymore in any way any kind of pretension to precision strikes as Israeli army has themselves said, and that the focus is on, in their words, on damage, not accuracy. How to talk about phantom images, operational images, war and violence without at least in some ways acknowledging the ways in which these recursive maneuvers are very much present in our contemporary context. The situation testifies to the complex image architecture continuity that is really central to these mode, mode, modes of power and is very interesting something of that I'm very interested in my work as well, and something that, of course, many architecture scholars have pointed out, of not just images, but also architectural reformatting of areas by ways, in ways that fa facilitate processes of targeting in the military and non military sense. And of course, in this, this way, counter practices of images that facilitate making sense of those areas by way of mapping different zones of occupation that have defined the way area as a target in the broader sense for a longer period, not just as part of, of a strike, but as part of constant measures of control of creating territories like there were images of pathways, checkpoints, and other forms of observational events that are installed as architectures of occupation. Um, and this has, again, been discussed um, by many architecture scholars and, uh, and recently also in the wonderful teach-in by Leopold Lambert from Funambulist um, that you can find online on um, architectures of settler colonialism in, um, in uh, Gaza. So, 
images that grasp the world and images that have an operational grip on the world. Let's return to this broader topic for a while before you know, going into dialogue. It follows a recursive understanding of images and importantly so, operational images are present in multiple spatializing contexts, not as representations of space, but as ways of engaging actively in the formation of space. The navigational notion of an image comes through in Farocchi's film and video works, but also encompasses a longer litany of operations that seem to be hinted at often when we use the term. On the one hand, operational images concerns real-time systems of identification, navigation, targeting, and related logistical operations where images are interfaces. And on the other hand, this implies a range of epistemic operations too, at least implicitly, of knowing, of modeling, of designing, of sketching, of projecting, of forecasting, of diagramming, as we just heard. As recursive operations upon space, of topographies, of geographies, of architectures, they involved in fabricating space in ways that is visible both in the sense of expanded architecture of destruction, for instance, military, of construction, such as design and design operations, starting from software as a site of operational images, or then, for instance, extraction, where images or sensing operations such as remote sensing are central to the larger scheme of extractive industries um, in the current moment. These two or three poles are also central how, to how the notion expands beyond the usual stories and becomes integrated into the broader questions of contemporary forms of operations to riff with the themes of Brett Nielsen and Sandra Mezzatra that we're speaking of not just operational images, but operations of capitalism that encompass finance, extractivism, and logistics. So one of the aims of my book really is to focus on more on the question of operation instead of just images. Images become bracketed in favor of operations. And I try to do more of a sweep through what are what is being implied in the different scales of where operations are being laid out and, and operationalized as such. Um, and this is also obviously the key thing that is central to um, Bernard's book and work in many ways as well. Um, one thing and one way to narrate the book, and again, our interlinks between our books is to ask the different scales of time or history at which we make sense of operational images. Like I mentioned that one of the sort of like interest at the back of my head was the fact that operational images has become de facto a crucial term for contemporary media arts, contemporary media theory, contemporary forms of discourse in design and architecture in many ways and many other fields as well. And it has a particular kind of implied art historical or visual culture history weight as such. And I was sort of interested in what would be then the histories through which one could make sense of it as well. On the one hand, the clearest that often is mentioned and is very relevant is the ways in which it links to that phase of 20, 30, perhaps just about 40 years of media theory. That is the explicit um, context in which operational images in relation to warfare is being often discussed. So familiar names of Paul Virilio, Friedrich Kittler, Wilhelm Flusser, and others are at the back of this appreciation of the idea that of the operational images emerges from a particular rationalization of the field of vision and as such really crucial to um, this body of theory and hence also the contemporary discourses, whether it's drones or something else. But the other one is really is the stuff that I was sort of like, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that if I could rewrite the book, um, I would probably, and with unlimited resources and time, I would probably want to emphasize the fact of the operational and operations research as tightly interlinked. Not exclusively so, but really in interesting ways that is not just about the exact term of operations research, but the ways in which it expands as part of the broader repertoire of thinking, rethinking of across human sciences that code the book um, does as well to emphasize this logic of knowledge creation or knowledge, how knowledge is being reformatted 
um, both during and after World War II, or even a tiny bit before World War II, and how this has a particular role to play, even if it's not necessarily always about images in the cinematic or photographic sense, but about the diagrammatic and the format of images that emerges that we just heard about, uh, particular technical uh, graphics or information aesthetics as such. Um, I won't rehearse now um, the history of operation research, but it's briefly more or less like this often. Um, the scientification of evaluation of strategic and tactical operations that becomes institutionalized on both sides of the Atlantic, roughly during World War II in the US and Britain, with their own flavor. And how this feeds into implementation of a certain scientific way of thinking about management problems gradually, emphasized after the war as well, not least logistics, issues from transport and communication to inventory management and other optimization issues. Um, Philip Mirowski has a wonderful term that deserves a mention in its own right when discussing um, operations research in the broader scheme of economics as well, blipkrieg, um, as a reference to operations research instead of blitzkrieg. Now, if war would be seen as a form of societal transformation, economic and organizational. This would, of course, make complete sense. And this is the usual story. And it's an influential story that really is one crucial context that cannot be dismissed. It's also about refashioning of science in the ways that we know from those terms that code offers a really great manual for as a pragmatic pursuit tied closely to socioeconomic modes of evaluation and evaluation of effectiveness, of optimization indeed, and the ways in which the notion of circuits of information between man and machine systems becomes one aspect of this, but also across different scales, like families, like other social units and so forth. Again, code. Um, now, this is really interesting as such, but it's also not just exactly, and this is exactly what also Berners book does, is that it's not just another story of warfare, but it really expands into this multiple other context of welfare um, and social organization, organization of knowledge. And I'm sort of a really curious about exactly this idea that Bernard Apley coins as retooling datafication for the war and its aftermath. And this resonates really closely to the, with the idea of what this thinking of training both the methodological way of understanding society as information aesthetics and providing particular epistemic devices means for this longer history of operational images as part of this, this idea of optimization of seeing society as patterns, pattern recognition, and as such. And it really flips the idea as well that we shouldn't probably see in the sort of a usual sense that it all flows from war to society, but perhaps there is a the imaginary at the back of this is also that it is that that war is itself the other way around. War is itself um, um, one version of of um, logistical organization of inventory management. This is imaginary, of course. It's not an endorsement. It's not an ethics. It's more like part of the broader societal ways of understanding um, links between science and tactic, tactic, strategy, logistics, and whatnot. There would be a lot to be said about exactly the question of what this implies then for not just warfare and welfare, but like what Eric Allier and Maurizio Lazzarato have pointed to in their book, Wars and Capital, as this sort of ex expansion of, of modes of capitalism in relation to this sort of optimization regimes. But I won't go into this uh, in the interest of time. And I'm just already skipping quite a lot of things because I know that I've got way too many notes at the moment. So this all sort of a fuzzy points that I'm making is really to point to that second stretch of time. So if the first one was really that operational images could be seen as, as this sort of a link inherently to a particular media theoretical notion since 1980s. This would be the sort of a story that emerges gradually across 20th century. And then the third one that is perhaps more visible in the book, all of these are visible in the book, but like the third one is basically of looking at how operational images expands to um, a longer history of datification of visual 
culture beyond digital images. Um, in other words, that even if operational images in most cases is often linked to digital images and the sort of questions of automation that emerge with computerization, digital computerization, it obviously has the link to um, pre-digital um, data cultures um, that I want to tease out through references that are bundled into Farocchi's work um, in, in, in his, his films like Images of the World and Inscription of War and others, where notions of photogrammetry play, are placed in that role of like looking at what are modes of rat rationalization of the image, what we would now call datification in photogrammetry as a particular coupling of image and data. Historically, this is a story that roughly emerges in mid to late 19th century and becomes crucial part of also all kinds of really administrative measures in various disciplines. Nowadays, we mostly talk about in relation to laser scanning and measurement images of that sort that is central to architectural building and other forms of understanding territories, urban and non-urban. But it has this really interesting relation to photo photography um, as photography's side companion since early times as part as part of this um, mathematization of space as well. A hat tip also, by the way, to talking about, you know, books that would have made your book different. Um, Andrew Witt's relatively recent formulations, Architecture, Mathematics and Culture, is one of those really outstanding books that I was reading after my book is out. Um, and I'm wishing that I read it before, um, as it deals exactly with this from the point of view of a cultural history of techniques of mathematization in architecture and space. Absolutely wonderful book uh, as a companion as well. So again, so this sort of a like notion of measurement image and its relation to 19th century is expanded to forms of colonial power um, that are central to 18th and 19th century image cultures as well in France and Britain. And there's a couple of kind of a questions that are planted in there in relation to notions of scale and planetarity. Um, and also trying to tweak and suggest of how notions of planetarity emerge, not only in the photographic or image cultures, but already in cartographic and geodesic uh, modes of measurement of the planet in 18th century, for instance. Um, the infamous French expedition of 1730s is my case study. And this way, rerouting notions that are central to contemporary humanities, architectural and media theory discourse like planetarity through historical dips like indeed 1730s expedition, um, geodesic ex expedition as well. So all of these sort of like themes relate to the ways in which history is bundled into this, even if it's not a history book in those terms that for instance, Bernard does much more closer and much more systematic writing of a particular narrative sequence that is really um, impactful. But I, I sort of hope that these, these concerns about forms of knowledge and the questions of image information interface come through in both books. Um, so even if, so I would say that Bernard's notion of code is one of the infrastructures of also my book in certain ways, um, informing the idea of already happened and long time happened transformation of, of these circuits and, and notions that are not just digital, but really relate to different scales of practices and techniques such as pattern recognition um, as, as described by Bernard as well. So I think I'm gonna leave it here uh, without um, in the interest of time because we just need to have a short discussion as well. Thank you so much and um, looking forward to having a chat. All right, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful talk. All right, so I think, uh, you know the reader of your book will be uh, more clarified, you know, by this talk, and uh, yeah, is uh, definitely. So, any any more uh, discussion from Bernard or some? Can I chime in or something? What do you want? Okay. All right. So, as you know, the yeah, both talks actually the struck me that um you actually um dig into the so-called primitive you know, accumulation of uh, some data, and then uh, which actually uh, shaped you know, today's world. That's I'm very fascinating. And then 
um, Bernard, you know, the, the evacuated some kind of layers of this uh, primitive accumulation, you know, in the base that uh, he uh, mentioned uh, how, you know, this world you know, came up, you know, the, by taking an example, the colony camps and asylum. And then this is, a, I think, a very new and, uh, you know, the discussion about, you know, this uh, origin of this world is after the Second World War. In the wild, uh, you know, the, you, you, you see actually, you know, the analyze how, you know, um, this mechanism um, produced some very interesting uh, effect of uh, operational image. And you said, you know, the, your book is focused on operation rather than image. That means that this operation, whatever called the system, um, the change that, you know, the way in which do we uh, approach to image or the way in which do we uh, perceive this image or the function of image, you know, the, from the, you know, visible to the invisible, in, invisible. That means uh, what actually the very, uh, what is very interesting in your book is that you said, you know, image is no longer, um, you know, no longer actually seeing, you know, and then uh, that means it visualizes always about the gaze, you know, the seeing, you know, rather than the, you know, the being seen or something like that. It's not, you know, objective one. It's uh, always uh, related to your gaze, you know, the seeing towards some object that is uh, might be called in the visual, you know, function of uh, image, but you said this image in visual. That means uh, um, image don't see, you know, don't see the anything, and then this image is there, and then uh, because of this operational um, the mechanism, you know, the separated from, uh, you know, what we actually already experienced. That means we experience is actually separated from this uh, image operation. That is very fantastic, actually, you know, the analysis of what we experience at the moment, and then and then this is really uh, funny. Okay, just I preserved the, the co my comment and question about uh, Bernard uh, for the later. And then actually, what uh, the what actually you know got the, when you Jushi um, Jushi actually you talk about that uh, operational image and then also when I reading your book, you know, because I live in South Korea, there's a, always we have you know the our another brother in North. North Korea. Have you seen like North Korea mass games? It's like a theater state, state of theater, something like that. So, um, you know, the um, pretty interesting thing, actually, interesting, what is interesting is that they actually, you know, perform the kind of uh, operation image, all right? Not by the, some, you know, the computer, but, uh, you know, human being. So human pixel actually actually they uh pompously uh pompously said you actually Western people you know use a computer but we use a human <laughs> to produce this produce this image. This is what exactly actually struck to you know to my my mind when I you talk about this conversational kind of image. How can we understand this state you know the directly intervened you know and then. Control, try to control this operation. Not really actually the kind of platform, something like that. Is it behind this, you know, theater? I mean, like, for instance, you know, the um, North Korean mass games. Is of course actually we couldn't, we could actually understand, that, you know, this might be some kind of image work, you know, and then because they try to put forward the kind of uh, image of a state, which is not really actually, you know, experienced by themselves. Is a kind of a tantalus, you know, the demand, you know, for the, some sort of a concrete in experience, but uh, you cannot do that. And then a uh, very actually Hegelian and recognition, you know, system there, you know, you can see, you know, and then also you can be seen by other people. And then there might be some operation of the kind of state power, something like that. So I think your theory also the apply for this, you know, the, the analysis of this kind of uh, something, you know, non computational. <laughs> You know, the production of image, that's uh, that's what I thought, right? So uh, could you any, you know, respond or something um, to comment? I'll be really brief if Bernard, you want to jump in then with something like a bit longer answer as well. But I think that that's, that's a really interesting example because I think it helps to also understand the sort of shared concerns we have. And again, the 
very notion of the idea of operational images as instructions for action already implies that instructions can be understood on this broader level. And obviously for much of sort of a cultural theory in human sciences after a particular period of 60s and 70s, instructions became the mode of understanding subjects and their relation in this sort of societal matrix. So you can see that we're already in this sort of idea of a particular ordering, organizing, algorithmic mode of understanding that is not just computational in the technical sense, but has this longer legacy, as we know from history of computing, but also history of what is the subject across, you know, of a Lacanian field of uh, organization of subject positions and whatnot. And again, Werner's book is exactly the sort of a like deep dive into this. And I want to add that it's, this is exactly the sort of a meaning that Thomas Elsesson and perhaps some others as well have wanted to tease out when they speak about the idea of, of Farocchi's work as life manuals, that it's really is about this broader sort of a like in, the, in his cinematic works, but then also what it implies perhaps to a larger societal understanding is, is something about these questions of, of institutions that train and the sort of a rescaling of the question of image to the sort of a question of institutions that are at the back of programming mm -hmm. of societies. This is a very simple way of putting of quite a complex things. And again, I think you know, I want to hand it over to Bernard to talk more about perhaps institutions or training or something else. Um, so thank you. I'm actually, I've, I'm going to seize on one little remark that Alex made in passing. Um, that I want to both respond to, and then I want to redirect the question back to back to Alex and Yusi. Um, this question of, of the gaze, right? So one of the things it seems to me like, and it, you know how it is. I mean, I'm I'm partly approaching your book in terms of problems I'm trying to sort out. Um, so one of the things I think is really interesting about operational images, the the book, right, is that it seems like you know, like you've been so Yusi's been very generous in in, for example, acknowledging people like. Virilio and Kittler and so on. Um, but in some ways, what it seems to me like this book, uh, it, it feels to me like it it works through what was a kind of crisis in visual culture studies and theories of the gaze in the 80s and 90s. And I'm kind of curious to hear Yussi's take on it. So there was this moment of visual culture studies in the 80s and 90s where everything was kind of in the shadow of Lacan, the gaze, Renaissance perspective, a certain idealized subject. And because that was, you know, it was, everyone kind of had this feeling like, okay, Renaissance perspective is a, it's highly sure. mathematical, it's highly rational, but still it's privileging this single human body. And we're going to say that it's, it's not just seeing, but when we talk about gaze, when we talk about a scopic drive, we're going to recenter around human bodies. Do you know what I mean? And their will to see, right? And then in a way, it felt to me, I don't know if you see reads the history the same way. I don't know if you see it, Alex. It felt to me a little bit like people like Virilio and Kittler partly tried to explode the whole the whole field by saying, actually, when everything is massive, massively large scale, micromediated by technical processes with multiple nodes and so forth, this whole reference to the human doesn't hold anymore. And suddenly it feels a lot more diff a lot more difficult in the wake of in the wake of operational images, like UC talks about them, it feels a lot harder to talk about gazes. Now, I think nobody in this conversation, nobody in this conversation thinks that technical images are just technical. I think in a weird way, I think we're all kind of struggling. And this is, I think this is part, part of what your discussion of Israel and Gaza is about, right? Israel and Gaza uh, replete with highly technical data-driven images that are massively, massively calculated. But for all of that, you know, um, in a weird way that calculation can 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 obscure deeply human and political stakes, deeply human and political strategies, right? Um, and so this is, I'm kind of circling back to, I'm curious, like you see what you think, like in an era of ubiquitous operational images, um, do we still want to use language like the gaze and the scopic drive i sort of feel like you've sort of taken the challenge of virilio and kittler and then restructured it in a way that starts concretizing and localizing and making human these highly technical images 
but I, 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 I don't know. I mean, can, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit because I'm trying to figure out where your book intervenes in these discussions. And I feel like you've kind of synthesized or catal- or worked through a problem that hit in the 90s. And that with your with your reappropriation of Parika or <laughs> with your reappropriation of Faroki, uh, mm-hmm. you've kind of gotten us back onto a way of talking about um, something like the micropolitics of mm. technical images or something like that. I mean, do, yeah. is there a question in there? Can you hear the question? Yeah, I think so as well. And I think, well, at least, or oh, then I, I might be hallucinating. I mean, I heard the question, and but I might be hallucinating. There might be a link as well to another topic as well in between. So there's something, there's many things interesting, exactly what you describe of those sort of a large terms of like what we're seeing as the key axis around which the question of image was and its politics was unfolded for good reasons as well, the gay stescopic and so forth, and what it meant for the subject in the midst of this sort of a like large scale sort of um, subjectification operations that already, you know, had a had a role to play. The other way of looking exactly, and this sort of is implied in some of these traditions and sometimes it's sort of a is it is 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 read into them is that um you know the renaissance you know um you know the the perspective and such i mean perhaps it was secondarily only about the particular subject perspective that was created perhaps it was just about the data packaging operation of packaging mathematical relations onto a two uh, flattened um two-dimensional information aesthetics that we happen to see as an image. Of course, it's not accidental. It's 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 meant to be so. But what if the priority would be placed exactly on those ways in which that information, it's an information surface for mathematical relations? And this doesn't mean exactly, and this could be seen as, well, this would be, you know, a certain lineage of like post-human German theory, and it's also very apolitical. But what if it's not apolitical, but it shifts the... The sort of politics to different questions of let's say the analyst the expert and the mm-hmm. ways in which this yeah. this regime that is often described by Trevor Pagel and perhaps and Felix Guattari you know earlier as well as, as this machine to machine communication but it's never of course is such thing as many many you know critics of AI but also other regimes have shown that it's yeah. always humans in the loop but like the question of the analyst or the expert becomes a really interesting category in the midst of this as well as one sort of a sorting device of what happens in terms of images and what is often read into a particular technocratic body of neutral modes of um, engineering of images but actually central to this sort of a not a scopic subject but still an operator of images so there's something Mm -hmm. about the category of operators in midst of this that relates then to politics of labor politics of implied of this is gender as well and they're sort of a like um status of knowledge or or indeed expertise that is coming coming into play as well and it seems awfully um technocratic indeed and partly it is but it's also interesting to see what would be then the sort of a questions of reinserting the politics of resistance into this scheme of sort of a um, of of more analytical or more expert driven discourses as part of of the image um, data complex as such um, this is not a at all a sort of an exhaustive answer at all it's one snippet of the sort of idea of what what would be instead of a spectator or the subject in those scopic terms what would be the other form of a, like a um, um, participant in the image regime as well, and how do we theorize that so that it sufficiently becomes inserted into a, a critical stance as well? Um, there's probably a lot to be said about this that is also complexifies this further on, um, mm-hmm. and indeed probably also in terms of you know post legacies of post humanities, not just the sort of the things that we both refer to as well. And I don't write so much about Kittler and such at all, but like it's of course implied but like critical post-humanities that is coming from uh, more feminist directions, for instance, and that is able to read this, this sort of a like uh, modes of agency through this sort of a critical eye um, onto, the, onto this, this sort of a body of theory that also emerges in 1980s, as we know, post-Haraway and so forth. So, I mean, if I can, if I can riff on that for a minute. Yeah, um, do that. There are a couple of things you said there that I so I like this idea of this shift from the scopic subject to the operator. Mm. Um, I think that's a really kind of fascinating 
uh, handle, right? I'm trying to figure out like a changing position, changing the, like, of course, visual culture studies has this long history of theorizing subject positions. But then visual culture studies itself has a positionality. And I like this idea that maybe it's this, it has to grapple with the operator. And then within that, there's a there's a kind of redistribution of politics of resistance, of participation, which is to say it's an open question where and how it's happening. But I I, I find that really helpful to understand thinking about where your book intervenes in these larger debates. I'm also I'm really excited by by this emphasis you put on the analyst and the expert, right? Um, so you know, the reason I part of the reason I wanted to talk about the Levi Strauss and the Bates and, and me today, I should really say. Bateson and Mead, and sometimes it's Mead and Bateson. Um, you know, one of the things, one of the things I want to understand in my book is like, again, okay, why, why do we always talk about cybernetics like this wartime machine invented by pe- mathematicians that then circulates more widely when it does seem like people like Margaret Mead was as key as anyone in that group in founding it and organizing it. And she was coming from, from anthropology, ethnography, linguistics. And and trying to understand what their relationship was to cybernetics, the question came back and again and again: Why did scholar, why did scientists of the human condition feel so compelled to recast themselves as experts, as analysts? You know, I we're dealing with such dynamo personalities. I would never want to say they they shirked or withdrew from critique, uh, that they shirked or critique they shirked or withdrew from. Um, uh aesthetic inquiry right but there was it does seem to me that there was a, a lot of these thinkers i i look at this drive to again it's like the foucault said this drive for yeah. scientific credentials through a new mode of theory that position themselves as analysts as experts and to a certain extent at a certain extent um i go back and forth in the book i kind of suggest there's technocrats um Whereas thinking about it now, I'd be very, very happy to actually say to position themselves as as human scientists that can also work in technocratic institutions, right? Um, it's a small difference, but maybe it's again Batesonian. It's difference that makes a difference. Um, mm. And I do, you know, in terms of in this, in terms of the shift from a scopic subject to an operator. Um, that's part of the reason why I just love looking at all of these diagrams that Livy Strauss is making, the films that Mead and Bateson are making, the manner that they're breaking them down into smaller and smaller units of analysis from which human insights can be extracted. I think there's, I think there's a history there that rather than view it, I, I think it's very easy to look at this as a kind of prehistory of big data, right? Um but that already makes it kind of teleological as, as if we're driving towards the computational and the digital. Um, I think there's actually, there's also a kind of uh, something that's both precedes and anticipates the proliferation of the operational images you describe and also a rich field of like alternative genealogies, alternative purposes, alternative reasonings that are all on some level about we actually as human scientists as people in the arts and humanities we can work with images we can make them we can extract all types of data in them but on some level what's interesting about for all the appeals levy strauss meet and bates and make to cybernetics you could actually never really compute any of the stuff they were describing right and so maybe maybe part of my book's fascination with the analysts and the expert you, you describe is also a fascination with other models of analysis and expertise that we can live with today that embrace the technical, that work with the technical, but also have their own kind of rationalities that both lead us places. And, you know, maybe sometimes we want to say, take paths we don't want to follow. Um, so I just, I really, I love your book so much. I find it so useful for rethinking what, what I've been trying to think about for a few years now. Yeah, and that's a really, really great description exactly of the sort of stakes of the notion of the expert in that longer sort of a like hundred year stretch. And that's yeah. exactly what I was sort of a in a very fuzzy way hinting at that it's already already packed into into many of the things that you draw out. Mm-hmm. Really, really good. Um, Alex, mm-hmm. um, do we have also like audience questions? There might be. Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, the, several audiences and already times you're running out. 
I I got the many you know question, but uh, I did not <laughs> ask, you know yield myself to the audience. <laughs> All right, uh, Sharon told, uh, thanks a lot for great uh, presentation, and for help this is a uh, Bernard, but also the UC, and then and his question is uh, you know. Sharon, uh, how do you see the relationship between French theory as a theory of liberation of the reader, liberation of the reader, liberation of uh, the con colonial subject, liberation of the post-human, etc., etc., versus a theory that instrumental in computational management? Example, for example, what is the relation between post-structuralist concepts of textuality and hypertext web? Uh, to, to uh, 2.0 social media and generative AI. Is there still a liberatory potential or are our freedoms as soon as they are schematized and the methodological, methodologically analyzed now fully tracked, monitored and exploited? Hmm. Both. <laughs> I can take a crack at it. So, um... It, I think there probably there there I think I think there is some space for liberation. Um, also, in a way, I I th and I what I like about the framing of the question is, I think Soren's frame immediately starts challenging French theory as a mere hermeneutics of suspicion, right? Which is just not quite rich enough. Um, but so I would say two ex a couple of examples. Like I think I think people like Bart and Livy Strauss and Margaret Mead. I think they were acutely aware of the the kind of violence of technology, the, and they were particularly concerned with state violence, right? And I part of their question was in seizing upon techniques like cybernetics and information theory. It wasn't to say these are innocent techniques, but perhaps their 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 kind of their violent force can also be used to reorder re reorganize some of our human relations constructively. Levi Strauss famously says that the purpose of the human science is is more or less to liquidate rather than to reveal the human, right? To overcome the human. And he does that specifically in relationship to cybernetics and information theory. And, you know, I, that's not to say, he's not saying, oh, we're going to be liberated. He's saying we're in for a rough ride. Our familiar points of references can, with new technical media, must be liquidated. But out of that, he dreams, he dreams in an almost utopic manner of, for example, new relationship between indigenous and, and Western knowledge, right? Um, Bart says something interesting and strange. Bart says, uh, he says, well, if we can get our statistics good enough to describe everything that's totally predictable about language, everything that's left will be human freedom, right? And, you know, I can't tell if that's a joke or if that's a real analysis, right? Um, but, you know, I, I think these theorists tried to kind of productively seize upon this oppressive potential that Soren is gesturing towards and then suggest we can't dispense with this. We can't ignore it. But let's see if we can work with it to also reorganize what are the most oppressive hierarchical aspects of the human sciences as, as we know them. Mm -hmm. You see? Yeah, that's a really great outline of many of the stakes and sort of like that it was uh, only a seeming impasse in certain sort of a seeming dead end. Um, my, this is very short and this is not again a full-fledged answer, but like my my personal allegiances and my sort of a way of thinking about perhaps beyond the sort of a political, otherwise easily politically sort of pacifizing affects was through um, Deleuze and Guattari and perhaps um, especially Michel Foucault's uh, preface into um, what was just 50 year anniversary of the anti-Oedipus. It's of a book that is partly well-aged, partly not at all well-aged, I would say. I think what has well-aged has been uh, Foucault's um, preface, which is still uh, perhaps one of the most amazing reads that I still can find about, like even how, from starting from the preface being a, um, a sort of a, how, how was it that, you know, the anti-Oedipus is a book about introduction to non-fascist life. Um, there's something so well resonating across the moment as well. And that there is this constant double sort of a like um, attempt to provide tools to analyze those seemingly unifying and seemingly totalitizing forms of power that come about in these sort of a systems that are weirdly enough also infrastructure for a lot of the sort of a critical you know potential that is coming from that so it's that's the first contradiction or the difficulty but then that it's it's only in the midst of this that one can also find this um beyond way beyond uh, any kind of a 
total retizing um, fantasies of uh, what they call in a fascism in those terms as well. And of course, what I'm interested in is that the sort of a like cultural history of this is is also like you point to really interesting things of how it relates to digital culture, as we know, and and, and Soren is is my uh, department friend, so we kind of uh, we can have this corridor talk, which is amazing. Um, but also then that some of this feeds really nicely into sort of a feminist, anti-colonial and other forms of critique or resonates st strongly with certain strands of those. And hence the sort of like critiques of notions of of knowledge um, that are positioned in relation to notion of human and whatnot that Rosie Brightotti and others sort of a tease out. This is really interesting in this um, broader aspect as well. It doesn't really come back to operational images, but it still is one of those things that I'm super fascinated about. And I still feel um, crucial again, is that Farokki's own um, um, role in, in since 1960s as, as a cinematic crit critique critic of um of um the industrial military industrial complex and its role to forms of knowledge from you know the uh, grim and 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 powerful film about napalm to uh, much more recent terms as well and, and uh, sort of a like use of computer games in relation to contemporary military formations and whatnot so it's it's, it's itself a bundle of these analytical coordinates that are really helpful um in those terms as well okay yeah, actually, um, do we have a second uh, question? But uh, you know, second question, it's uh, actually same same one. Actually, I think you know the question, the audience already satisfied. You know, the with your answer. So I think we have uh, and ten minutes to go. So actually, the I have you know the some um idea about you know your answer and the discussion of that topic. I think actually Foucault is Michel Foucault is a very important, you know, one of the very important and uh, resources, you know, or some reference for your, you know, the theoretical scaffolding of your works. So, you know, um, for instance, you know, the uh, the, the Michel Foucault's concept of, of biopolitics and then some um, human capital, you know, that actually the, the, that idea was discussed in the the birth of biopolitics, and then. Quite uh, symptomatically, he didn't, you know, discuss the biopolitics in the seminar, but rather dis discussed the you know, human capital. And then uh, this human capital, he didn't actually discover the, he didn't like discuss in you know, further cybernetic and information theory there. Very symptomatic, but uh, but he found something in the you know the Chicago School, and then of course these you know the economists is from Austria and build up. The, you know, built up the you know kind of uh, as you know the as the theory of neoliberalism, and then as you know the actually this neoliberalism is to some point uh, combined with uh, information theory or some cybernetic you know, you know, and then since the Second World War, and then this is actually my uh, what what actually quite curious is that you know to, how can we actually understand this uh, combination? How can you no know, where is the actually you know the the place of neoliberalism in your 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 works in your in your books you know so uh you know actually the the lot of hipponidias for instance is an austrian economist and then this economist you know they immigrated to america and the hayek and then you know lots of this uh, school and they developed their own you know the theory of economics also mathematical you know theory of economics you know for instance, Gary Becker, you know, something like that. And then, you know, we didn't find out any direct link, you know, between them. But anyway, just uh, there is kind of some shared, you know, um, opinion, you know, to uh, um, transform the whole world, you know, the, in this kind of scientific, you know, sense or some, you know, the, the, the burnout, you know, the... the According to Bernard, discussion is uh, pragmatism and then, you know, the technocracy. And then, uh, so actually, the, how can we actually understand this uh, remnant of, uh, remnant of uh, you know, information theory, which is uh, combined with this uh, theory of human capital? I'm, I'm going to try to make it, uh, I'm trying to make an unfairly short answer because the long, because there's such a complex topic. 
So yeah. I think I think you point to two things that are important, right? One is that I think clearly the history of French theory, cybernetics, and neoliberalism do in a certain sense belong together, right? So the, the foundation of kind of structuralism, and we find this also in Mead and Basin's, you know, culture and personality school of anthropology, but the foundation of structuralism is a tripart tripartite notion of communication. They say society is communication. Language, kinship, and trade comprise the entire domain of human activity. And all of these are systems of exchange or this is Levi Strauss citing people like von Neumann, their systems of communication, right? Um, so the, the history, this kind of the part of this history, the history of the analyst, the history of the expert, the history of the technocrat, the history of theory, all these things we're talking about com, co, concern in some way a convergence of a baffling variety of domains around the problem of communication, right? I think part of the lesson of the operational image is that the operational images are saying all images will communicate. They will all become data. You know, they'll never just rest in themselves. So I see this kind of cybernetic informationalization and in operational images. And, but the one thing I would wonder, and this is just, this is at the top of my head, right? So for example, if you take Levi Strauss, one of the things he says though, the, Levi Strauss says it's all about communication, except, he said, unless you have prohibitions on communication, unless you have, for example, prohibitions on incest, all communication systems exhaust themselves and become nothingness. You can't have any organized structure of culture unless there's things that do not exchange, right? Um, and then, you know, that plays out in a lot of different ways through through the through kind of French theory. But I so I somewhere I suspect lurking inside of this schema is something that is anti-communicative that I don't think I can do justice to today, but that would also somewhere break with the Austrian school and Hayek, uh, you know, if it was followed through. It's just a suspicion. Mm -hmm. mm. It probably relates to in some ways, and I've got only, a, I can't really form it into a full sentence, but this is somewhere at the back of probably Gilles Deleuze's head as well, when um, Deleuze um, loathes um communication completely that you know this is where thinking goes to right. die is communication and they're sort of like probably at the back of the Lewis's head was that this is part of the sort of lineage of control that he was then trying to thematize perhaps obviously it comes out as a bit romanticizing then there's what is thinking then beyond that but without wanting it to become a heideggerian thing um so Again, I don't have expertise to talk about the big economic theory side of things, but I'm sort of interested in exactly like the question of like, what would, how do operation images help to think in a very media studies and cultural techniques way, these devices through which particular economic thinking is being embedded as infrastructure, as media, as forms of imaging that then play a substantial role in enacting a thing called, we call neoliberalism. So it's really this classical move of like, okay, if neoliberalism is our ontology, what are the operative devices through which this ontology is being bootstrapped? Um, some of those hints are in many recent books, like I mentioned, Nielsen and Metzadras, um, take on um, operations of capitalism defined by finance and logistics and extractivism so but these are also very generic terms we can be very concrete about the ways in which for instance what would be the sort of a devices through which finance takes place and what would be the sort of forms of i would say that not just images even if questions of dashboards for instance feature in the sort of a like information visuals that are central to a lot of procedures of finance and one could make a whole long list of this but also the question of the diagram but also, the sort of a question of the mathematical equation comes as a really interesting epistemic unit, aesthetic and epistemic unit, um, even if most stripped of its aesthetic sort of, a, you know, classical aesthetics. And this is a really interesting sort of a way of thinking about that, again, the same stretch of time. And this is something that resonates with other recent books as well, like or it Halpern and Mitchell's um, smartness mandate, where they focus on a couple of key equations um, of, of, of so-called neoliberal period in terms of finance as, as these sites and hinges through which um, deriv derivatives and other financial mechanisms are being bootstrapped into being and become ontogenetic, they become reality producing. And the idea that this ontogenetic force of images, diagrams, mathematical models, 
this from really like um, expressed in graphical notation to complex software models. There's something about this stretch as this stretch of operational images that really interests me, which is not solved as, as a sort of a like a exhaustive analysis, but I'm more like thinking that, okay, perhaps this is where operational images can be a useful methodological concept to help with as well, to do much more detailed analysis around these hinges, these devices, these, these operators that are, again, um, media of sorts. Yeah, yeah. It's very uh, the, yeah, informative. And so uh, we have a more audience question. The, I think the time is already the runs up. But anyway, just uh, Sharon uh, asked the Bernard the, the Bart code. So where is the problem? Is reference? Do you have a, do you have a reference? One with the Bart, wrong Bart, code. You're muted, Bernard. Sorry, uh, the, the the Roland Bart, the reference to statistics, is that what the yeah, question yeah, yeah. is? Um, is it is it in your book? Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely yeah, it's in my book. It's yeah, a comment. It's it's, it's, it's a book, comment. Yeah. Bart makes, believe it or not, he makes it in the nineteen forties. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and so the let me see if I can quickly pull it up. Um. Uh, it's in. So it's in the album Unpublished Correspondences and Texts by Roland Barthes. And um, the, basically, if you look in there, I, I don't have the name handy, but there's a, a text he wrote in the 1940s or maybe early 1950s where he talks about um, what quantitative methods will bring to literary studies. And that's where he makes the, the remark I mentioned. Yeah, and then last question. And then after this, we're going to finish. So Norma Mushi. And the images are much more than pictorial representation. They are, as you both showed, infrastructure for analysis. They mediate how we see, how we understand, how we imagine the world. My question is has to do with the relationship between political imagination and operational images. What are the political Im imaginaries that operational images generate in our you know dark times? So uh Good, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. question. Um, I, I can briefly sort of riff with this without, yeah. Um, it's a great question as well because it's it's um, there's an analytical quality to thinking through operational images that I find the primary help, analytical and helps, hence also this aesthetic one as well, and it riffs with what Faroki in some one small text was like mentioning as as um, the unspoken rules for filmmaking, and there's one that. That goes something like that. If 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 there is a new image in the world, remember to engage with this. That you know, you sort of it's your duty to think about the new images that are appearing in the world, as already creating Im imaginaries as well. So I kind of also like many other writers recently as well are interested in this sort of like poetic and creative imaginaries that are in the midst of these seemingly ahuman images, for instance, without them losing their political significance in a more progressive sense as well. Hence, I'm thinking that there might be ways of sort of a thinking that what would be then the sort of a more progressive political worlds that are created from operational images of simulations, models, and other sorts of things that are a different political cinema, a different political representation, um, as they sort of uh, work with contemporary questions of data, AI, and such, but do not necessarily only kind of return to their usual corporate rhetorics uh, in those terms. And I think that there's a long legacy of this sort of a like... Post-human is a term that is so corrupted nowadays because it's been used so badly and in many ways. But again, the, the good kind of a critical post-humanities, I think that has already pointed to the sort of interesting ways of thinking beyond the usual figures of the um, male corporate white um, you know, status of subjects and to other legacies of, of, of imaginaries. And I think that it would be interesting to see if Operation Images can participate in this again in, in other ways as well. So... And, Again, um, perhaps we'll leave to another context the possibility of. I think Faroki's films already have a lot of really great points and they're sort of like really nuanced take on the questions of um, labor and, and whatnot is, is really central to thinking also of political imaginaries. All right, thanks. I would just say, I sort of think, 
I see, for example, in Faroki's work, I see in mm. Parika's work, and so far as they're doing a kind of genealogy of operational images, part of the story there is also, you, you're not just talking about all the instructions the images provide, all the all the possibilities for interventions they provide. There's also a kind of always a story of the many parts of the world that are not mapped by these images, right? So I think a lot of these these histories of operational mm. images and, and, and their criticism, um, I think to me, I actually, I have this feeling, the more I learn about the way digital images work, or, you know, is the more I have the sense that like, oh, these intensive surveillance systems, these proliferations of images mapping everything, leave so much of life untouched, right? And leaves and so much, and, you know, it's a problem because our world is being organized by images that are willfully mm -hmm. exclusionary, right? But I, I guess I sort of think there's a utopia in that, right? That actually uh, it's, it kind of, um, it breaks, it breaks the kind of hypnotic power of these images to start recognizing that there's, you know, actually, I mean, there there are gazes and glances and interactions and sights and scenes everywhere that so far are untouched by operational, by many operational images. And I I think, so I think historicizing and critiquing them the way, you know, Yusi or Faroki did is also an invitation to valorize other images that that are thriving everywhere in our in our midst, you know, mm. or could thrive. I totally exactly. totally agree with you. And then, yeah, exactly. That is uh, what we shoot, you know, at the moment. Is uh, mm. I think that there, it, it might be a, some, uh, you know, that kind of attempt to, uh, you know, the analyze the, or some historicize, you know, this kind of origin of the world is, uh, you know, the push this the focus in the project. You know, beyond his own limit, and then also mm -hmm. found out, you know, more uh, insightful uh, political moment. All right. So, thank you very much. And then I think the time has already run up. I don't want to take your time more because you are in the middle of the day. So enjoy. Well, the and you're in the middle of the night at this point. <laughs> right. I said, well, we want to take your all your all your time for sleeping. Um, Next time, I, I really want to invite you in person in Korea, and then we will actually organize, you know, further, you know, event sooner or later. It would be an honor. Absolutely. Yeah. In touch, and then thank you very much today. Thank you for your, your you know, the exception, acceptance of invitation. Thank, thank you, you so much, much, Alex and Ben. For hosting us. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you audience care. as well.